The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 732 for Monday, October 22nd, 2018. Ah, greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Up, the show where we take all your questions, all your tips, all your cool stuff found. We mix them together like a big stew because it's like getting chilly outside and it's nice to have a good stew going. So we get a good stew going. This week, the stew includes some things about uh, the best way to charge your iPhone, managing spam calls on your iPhone. Uh, we've got some fun stuff about deleting stuff on your Mac, but that's all just part of the stew. And we mix it all together so that each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include iMazing. We're at iMazing.com slash MGG. You save 30% on all licenses to that stellar iPhone management utility. We'll talk more about that in a moment for now and hopefully for the duration of the, sh the episode here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut with actually, I have some, um, some, uh, sirloin marinating in the nice. fridge. So maybe I will make some stew, but this is nice. John F. Brown. Nice. I like that. Yeah. Stew is delicious. The right time of year. It's gotta be the right time of year. We made pumpkin chili last night. So that was good. So, you know, I could do without the, the potatoes and the vegetables. I think I'm, I'm just, just into the, the meat. I'm a meat eater. I admit, I admit it. I'm you should sorry. eat. You should eat vegetables. I, I listened to a, a big long podcast. It was an episode of the Joe Rogan podcast where these two dietitians were arguing back and forth about. Uh, really, they mostly agreed, but they they decided to argue about veganism versus like the paleo diet. But um, but they both really agreed. If you're going to eat meat, eat with vegetables. And so there you go. So I'll, I'll share that with you. That's not usually yeah. the kind of advice we share here, though. But uh, but you well, know, I think. Well, I think we could hear and, and some other advice that well, we had shared. And, and our, well, well, we, we just had some advice or, or, or an observation in our chat room here, Dave. Where's our chat room? It's at MackieGap.com slash stream. And our friend Michael King says he has a T-bone on the grill right now. So nice. OK, <laughs> uh, great. Well, listener David actually has some stuff to share with us. Uh, he points out that. And this started in iOS 11, I believe. But he says, have you guys noticed that there is a scan documents option now in notes and it will save to a PDF file as well, which is super handy. He says, I never noticed it before. Yeah, it's there. It's been in the iOS version of notes since um, since I or it's been in the iOS version of notes since iOS 11. And uh, yeah, it's actually really handy. It's being able to scan, you know, right there. It's uh, you just hit the plus button inside a note and you get scanned documents and you're good to go. We've got a little link uh, that we'll send. Uh, I think we did a how to on it back in April. But uh, yeah. now has this because uh, I thought he was talking about notes on Mac, Mac OS. No. No, okay. it's in so it's in iOS always... notes. Yep. You just hit scan documents and you're you're good to go. Okay, um, but it, it, when did it start being in? I, I I don't recall it being in Notes on Mac OS, but I see it here as well. There's like a little little menu, and if you click on it, uh, like a little picture menu, and and it has three options: photos, take photo, and scan documents. Oh, maybe so. that is what he meant. Ha ha! Look at this, a double tip. I like it. Ah, and yeah, I think. Well, you know what? You're on uh, Mojave, right? On that machine, Correct. John. And I am on, on this particular one, I am on High Sierra. And where do you see your notes thing? All right. So if you, if you run notes on Mac OS, yeah. you look in the upper right hand corner, you should see if this feature is enabled, right. a menu that looks like uh, three pictures in nope. a row and then a down arrow. You nope. do not see that. No, that's really? new. That's new. Oh my gosh. And I just clicked on it again. So. It, it initially showed one menu, which was titled John's iPod Touch, and it has two options, take photo and scan documents. But then when I clicked on it again, Dave, apparently it found my other devices, probably uh -huh. to, to 
Yeah, the continuity whole continuity or whatever. Thing. Yeah, exactly. But it also now shows John Efron's iPhone 8 and John Efron's iPad Air as two other sources because they both have cameras. Wow. Okay. So we got like a, a mega tip here. Because uh, uh, again, it wasn't clear to me what he was talking about. So yep. it's, uh, it's so I, I guess the thing is, is that it's on both Mojave and iOS 12. Um, you now get this option from notes. Cool. Ah, pretty good. Pretty good. Sweet. Thanks. To, yeah, I don't know which uh, which notes David was talking about. It wasn't clear from from his note, but hey, there you go. Uh, another tip, actually a double tip from listener Ron, uh, who says, let me find it here. He says, uh, something cool happened that I wasn't expecting. I got caught. I receive several phishing emails every day in my Comcast account. Uh, none on my iCloud account, he says. I saw one that said Spotify charged me $159 for a year's subscription, and I don't have Spotify. I was freaked out and tired and made the mistake of clicking on the click here button. And lo and behold, Eero Plus blocked me from going to the site. That got my attention. He says, I usually don't get caught. When I checked the sender's address, of course, it was, as usual, weird. He says, to me, that makes Eero Plus more than work it, not to mention the other stuff like VPN and 1Password subscriptions and things like that. Good stuff, he says. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Eero Plus is, uh, yeah, they, they're doing good stuff with that. And, and, this is where it gets really good, John. He says, I'm sure you know, but Small Cube's mail suite is now out and he is right about that. So we get to use, this is the thing that uh, Small Cube is the, the company that makes all the mail plugins. They made make, um, uh, what is it? Uh, mail tags, mail act on, mail perspectives, and Sig Pro, all of which are now rolled into a product that they call Mail Suite. And that finally came out last week. So yeah, we can all use ah. that again in, in Mojave. So, so they were bit behind the curve with Mojave, which we'll, were, we'll let it we'll let it slide this one time. Uh, you know what? All's well that ends well. So here yep. we are. We're good. Yep. So thank you for that very much, Ron, for the heads up. We had, you know, Era Plus, the only thing. So so you know, they they threw me and I think you uh, you know a subscription um, mm -hmm. just to check it out. But um, my only it gives you a report that tells you about all the scan events and the and the threats that it prevented. Yeah. Thing is, I personally like a bit more detail, Dave. Now that could be a double-edged sword. You know what I'm saying? So I, it's like, oh well, we blocked the phishing attempt. It's like, well, we, I've seen it identify threats that it claimed to protect me from, but I don't know what they are specifically. You can really dig like in. To. You can dig in in the app and see some of those details. Right when you when you go in and and look at like the list of of things that it blocked. No. Um, I'll, I'll double check. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sends you, you an email every week saying, you right. Know, you get the here's, summary, here's what happened. the summary email. But if you go and you have Euro plus, you launch the app, you go into the upper right corner and you'll see the little stats logo icon. Yeah, it's not yeah. A logo. Yeah. You hit that. And then if, if there have been, uh, you know, threats, you can, you can look and dig deeper and, and get more details about, you know, which, which kinds and all that stuff. Right. All right, so activity, threat, blah, okay, and actually I haven't had any, so I've had 70,000 yeah. <laughs> inspections, but sure. it, it has not identified threats. So, yep. uh, but right, I will, I will, to get more detail I will agree with you app. that too much detail can be a problem. Um, in fact, it was a question that I had not queued up for this episode, but I, I happily will, will have the discussion now that, uh, now that you brought it up, the, um, you know, Synology added their own threat protection to uh, their routers now with, mm -hmm. with version 1.2 of the Synology SRM, which is their router firmware. And and it works. It's great. But it provides way too much detail when it's just configured default. Like I was getting, you know, push notifications and emails constantly like like many times an hour about all sorts of things so i had to go in and like dial it back a little bit and i i set it to only email me when there was something like a, a dos attack uh which should never happen at my home by the way uh a successful administrator privilege gain and i think that's pretty much it 
Otherwise, I let it continue to do all of its blocking and everything, but it does it without mm-hmm. me involved and I don't need to know. And if I want to go look, I can go and dig into the reports and see all that stuff. But man, it was way too much information. So, so, okay. you know, yeah, yeah, I think I saw in, yeah, in a discussion you, you were having with someone, a, a, a screenshot. And yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, there's this many oh. individual threats that it identifies. Yeah. That's way too much. There's, there's like 10,000 told them. about all of them. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, no, it's insane. It, it was crazy. And some of them were like, like not bad. Like I was being notified of things. It, it, I forget what the description was, but it was essentially not a threat. Like that's what the description of the threat that I was being notified of was that. Don't worry. This is not a threat. It's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I really don't need a push notification for that. Thank you. So, okay. Yeah. So with Synology, you were able to manage it through. Through the web their, interface for their, which is how you manage their routers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Eero may want to open it up just a little bit more. Yeah, they so won't. We'll see. No, they won't. I, okay. I mean, you don't want, like, I, I, well, I mean, they're really geared for, you know, to make life easy. I, like I, they are definitely, if someone's, if someone's erring on one side or the other, the side of not providing too much information is is the right one for for this. You don't want your router running your life, right? Like, I mean, you want it running your life, but you don't want to know about it running your life. You just want it to do its thing and stay out of the way. And it and it does, mm-hmm. you know, like I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I am using a new piece of gear here, John. I again. Uh, yeah. Oh, boy. I always come on. It's just how we do things here. Uh, the the way I have things set up here in the studio, I have the 27 inch iMac, and then immediately to the right of that screen is the mixer that I use, which is a Mackie Onyx mixer, and then to the right of that is a second screen that I use. And I've I've had a 27 inch screen there for a while. I had a mono price. Uh, UHD screen, you know, right, right next to it, which is great, but that's a big screen to have that far away. And I'd always sort of wondered, well, would it make a difference if that screen were curved? Because that way the far edge would actually be much closer in and I wouldn't have to sacrifice having the close edge further out. Right. And so I'm checking out this ViewSonic. It's a it's a curved 27 inch screen. It's the VX 2758. No, uh, link will be in the show notes, of course. And it's a 1080p monitor, so it's not a UHD thing. It won't do Retina. Uh, I believe they have one coming that will. But this thing, it really it it. Th- so first of all, the answer is a resounding yes, especially if you're having a monitor sort of off to the side. That curve is fantastic to have on there. Uh, you know, they started with curved TVs. I never really bought into that. I never really, I, I tested one and it was like, no, this is stupid. But when your focal point is one human, that's pretty close to the screen, the curve starts to make a lot of sense because you're not, you know, you're not looking as far to see those edges. And it really does help. It makes a huge difference here. Even though I've, I've, you know, quote unquote, gone down in resolution because I've, it's not a UHD screen, so it won't do any sort of retinizing or anything. Uh, it, you know, having that curve is like, oh yeah, this is great. It's a, it's a nice little screen. It's got speakers in it if you want to use those. And, you know, it's, it, this one's got a, what, 144 Hertz refresh rate. I think my Mac will support up to 120 on this screen, which is, uh, which is great. So very cool stuff, really smooth motion on it and the colors look great. It's, uh, you know, all right. So you yeah. dig the curve thing because now that I think about it at first, what, when I, I'm like, why would you curve it? Because screens have always been, well, for the most part, at least LCD screens or OLED screens have been flat, flat. Right. But now that I think back, I mean, the analog tubes were curved and our eyeballs are curved. Well, they, so maybe the curve thing makes sense. The analog tube right. was curved the wrong way. <laughs> right uh, it, it, it was convex it, instead of concave right? yes I, I would i would agree with that yeah yeah but this is it really makes a difference i, I i'm kind of blown away yeah yeah and i could see where having this as your main screen would also be a great thing you know curved because it's right there it's you know you're not you you're not looking further to get to the edges it's you know it's a 
pretty standard thing. It's pretty good. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm impressed. It's good stuff. So very interesting. And it's uh, I think it's it's less than three hundred bucks. It's like uh, from View Sonic no. uh, two seventy three. That's what they asked for it. So yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. It does. It it makes it a little more immersive. Is really what it does. So yeah, pretty cool. I'm all for hey, that. I want to talk about our first sponsor, if that's okay with you, my friend. Fantastic. Sweet. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the show, our first sponsor is iMazing. And man, like, if you have an iPhone or an iPad and you want to do anything with that, with your Mac, you want iMazing, right? iTunes does a very, very small amount, like in the, in the range of things that your Mac can do to manage and, and manipulate data on your iPhone and iPad, your Mac gets to like 8% and then iMazing picks up and gets you all the way out to a hundred percent. It's, it's really that good, right? It can, and it can, and should be the way that you manage your backups uh, for sure. It can also allow you can put apps on there if if you need to take apps off. Like if you're like me and you barf all kinds of apps all over your phone and and then you want to clean those up. It's a pain to do it right on the phone. It's it, nearly impossible to do in iTunes. Amazing. Right there. Makes life easy. Go ahead and do it. You can also put files out onto your phone with this. They've got a drag and drop thing. They call it the drop zone. It just allows you to just drop files right into it. It'll say what app do you want it to go to really, really working well. And because I amazing is a Mac app, dark mode support for Mojave is supported uh, as is migrating data over to the new iPhones, the, the 10 S and the 10 S max. And of course the 10 R is coming out later this week. So very, very cool. You got to check this out. So and they're always adding new features. They're obsessive about this because they use this too. So you got to check it out. Go to imazing.com slash MGG. That gets you a 30% discount on all licenses. So go check it out. imazing.com slash MGG. And of course, as always, our thanks to iMazing for sponsoring this episode. John, you want to take us to David? I'm going to take us to David. Sweet. David's, David's got a problem, I think. Okay. And David writes, hi, John and Dave. I have an early 2015 MacBook Pro that I've upgraded to 10.14 Mojave. My pattern is I mostly charge the laptop during the day at work and then put it to sleep and use it intermittently overnight or on the weekends at home. It always has had good battery life and usually it only loses a little power overnight if I don't use it. Until Mojave, that is. I noticed at some point a week or two ago that the battery was heavily depleted in the mornings when I would return to work. At first, I thought I just wasn't remembering using it, but when I paid more attention, I realized it wasn't me using it. It's just running down much quicker. As a single example, I shut it down last night after using it for a while at home. It was at 70% charge when I did that. Today, when I plugged it in at work, 10 hours later, it was down to 46%. Oh. In the past, at most, it would have lost 1% to 3%. And yeah, that's been my experience as well. Yeah. Um, as, as I said, I've upgraded to Mojave, but nothing else is really different. I run dark mode, but can't see what that would matter in sleep mode. My battery shows 359 cycles, and it is in normal condition with a full charge capacity of 55, 23 milliamp hours. Okay, that sounds good. For the first night or two after I started paying attention to this trend, the laptop felt warm to the touch when I pulled it out of its carrying case at home while it was sleeping. It doesn't seem to feel that way anymore. And at best I can tell, it isn't running down quite as fast as it was a week or so ago. But it isn't acting like it did before the upgrade either. Am I the only one to encounter this problem? Do you have any thoughts on what might be causing it? Um, huh. So I think right, uh, you may be the only one. <laughs> uh, if any listeners run into this, uh, let us know. But um, my guess, Dave is that Mojave introduced a change to the sleep behavior of your machine. If you're having power issues, though, um, the first thing I would do would be to reset the SMC, since if you look at the page, which you're going to put in the show notes, it's called How to Reset the System, reset the system Management Controller. The System Management Controller is this chip with some configuration in it uh, inside your Mac, but a lot of things that it handles is dealing with 
power events, whether it be charging or lights or whatever. So that's the first thing I tried, Dave. Yeah, it sounds to me like it's not sleeping is I mean that and I've had this and I and I and I get to that. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. It's, it it sounds I, it no, it, that's what I'm saying is like it it I've seen this with my 2011 uh MacBook Air where sometimes it will just I'll I'll go to like wake it up and it'll be hot and you know clearly having been running and all of that. And I think resetting the SMC is also helpful with that. So it's Hope. a start. Okay. I think. Um, otherwise uh now that you stole my thunder, but otherwise, it sounds like for whatever reason, the machine is no longer sleeping when you think it is, which is, the, is what you just said. Right. My experience with my MacBook Pro is that sleep mode consumes very little power and you should see your battery go down maybe a few percent, but not half the charge if it's sleeping overnight. Right. And yeah, also, he do said, you, do you see that with and, yours? Have you seen that with yours where you go to wake it up and it's even if it's plugged into power, it's hot and obviously been running and not not sleeping i had that happen once with one of my prior ones and here's what was happening if i recall what happens is that at that at some point i had a bluetooth peripheral in my computer bag mm. and there's a setting in bluetooth that says if there's bluetooth activity you better wake the machine up and that's what was happening it was waking my machine up because i had a bluetooth peripheral that somehow got jostled and the the machine was like, oh, well, you told me if there's Bluetooth activity, I should wake up. So I'm going to wake up and then I'm in a bag and I'm insulated. And now yeah. I'm going to get really hot and run the fans and uh, and run the battery down. And it's like, dude, stop. Yeah, so. stop. Yeah. <laughs> so in the in the chat room, we've got a couple of people saying that they've seen the same thing. And, and Kiwi Graham says he's actually seen iMazing, believe it or not, be the culprit for keeping his MacBook Pro awake. He says it gets stuck trying to talk wirelessly to his iPhone. And and I can see that, right? Where if you've got some process that says, no, 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 I need to talk. I have stuff to do. You know, the same sort of general scenario that you're talking about with your Bluetooth device, then yeah, your Mac's going to stay awake. I, yeah, I, I, this is, this is, you, this is not uncommon. You're not alone, David, in terms of the solution, uh, you know, take what you've heard here, Maybe you've got some process that's looking to do some wireless activity. Maybe uh, you've got, you know, maybe the SMC needs to be reset. I haven't found on mine. This happens, you know, once a month, I'll say. And uh, I haven't been able to narrow down what it is. It it doesn't happen like I don't do anything differently that I can tell. Obviously, something different has happened. We know that because that's how computers are. But I can't tell what that something different is. And every now and then I'll right. go pull it out of the bag and it's like, you know, hot to the touch. It's like, man, come on. You're going to blow yourself up if you keep doing this. It's not good. It's bad. It's bad. Now, I, now I had one observation is that in his email, I think it was a typo, but he said, when he shut down the machine and then woke it up and then looked at it the next day, it went down like half of the uh, the battery capacity. I think he meant sleep. I don't think he meant shut it down. I'm almost certain. Now, the thing is, yeah. if you shut your machine down and it loses half its battery overnight, then you have serious battery issues. That's um, a different. Yeah, that would is, be a different problem. That's right. Yep. And now the thing is, there is a place you can go. We're also going to link to this. Say you want to know all of the exchange of repair programs that Apple has in place, Dave. Well, you'd go to apple.com slash support slash exchange underscore repair, and they'll tell you all the programs. And actually, there is one for the th for a 13-inch MacBook Pro, but not the 15-inch that okay. he has. So uh, a battery draining without the computer being on could be due to the battery malfunctioning or swelling or whatever. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. That's another possibility. And even though you're, you're, you're not under a repair program, there could be something with your battery. I mean, it's a 2015, but still. Sure. You never know. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. 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 Um, for sure. Yeah. Um, otherwise the thing is what you could do is I, I recently did a little write up um, called how to tell what's waking or putting your Mac to sleep. The thing is, if it is waking up when it shouldn't read this article, and you'll find out what is waking or putting your Mac to sleep. I, I had a similar issue with my Mac Mini, Dave, is that for whatever reason, you know, I'd come in the room and I'm like, I put you to sleep. Why are you up? Yeah, right. 
Yeah. And I did the same thing. I'm like, what woke you, what woke you up? And the thing is, it's not going to tell me if I ask it or ask, uh, you know, who mm-hmm. the S word, or maybe it will, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, in this case, looking at the logs and looking for the reason the machine woke, uh, may tell you why your battery is draining. And like, you know, like we discussed, it could be a, a, a nearby peripheral, uh, uh, who knows what yeah. the logs could or should tell you. And that's all I got to say about that. Yeah. 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 It used to be, you know, with the lights on the, on the old, like, you know, titanium MacBooks or whatever, you could tell when it went to sleep, like the, the light would go from what fully lit to pulsing and you'd be like, okay, great. It's asleep. Cause it used to happen with those too. Right. You know, it would start doing some activity on, on its way down and never finish and it would just stay on. This is this is not a new thing, but it's a frustrating thing. Speaking what of, makes me miss yeah. what makes me miss, and then moving on. But the only thing that I miss in the in the newer Max Dave is that if either of my machines wake up, I'll know it because I hear the DVD drive make its little <laughs> yeah. wake up sound. With the newer machines, where you don't have that anymore, how do you know when it wakes up? And you don't. You really yeah. don't, unless you look at the logs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope that it's. Yeah, you don't. That was another sign. Is that sometimes even now my 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 2012 machine, I'd hear the rear rear, and I'm like, okay, why'd you do that? Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of heat and all of those related things, we got a note, a uh, question from Rod, and Rod asks. He says, "Has anyone done any research into whether Qi or Lightning charging, so wireless or wired charging?" is better for the longevity of an iDevice battery. Basically, is one method of char- charging healthier for or less impactful on a battery? Since I realize the degradation of iDevice batteries take potentially years to show any real significant signs, but I'm always looking for ways to maintain optimal health for my devices. So I, I've thought about this. In fact, we even sort of speculated on it briefly in a previous episode. But, I, you know, I've noticed how much warmer my iPhone is while charging on Qi, versus lightning i mean it warms up either way but on chi you know it makes a lot of sense that it would be even warmer because so much of that chi energy is lost to heat in the coil and and not actually captured by the battery uh you know as as new charge so uh the heat also then warms the case which i would presume warms the battery uh Now, I know the batteries have temperature sensors or the iPhones have temperature sensors everywhere, including on the battery. So maybe it slows down its charging, but still heating a battery continually and routinely doesn't seem to bode well for its longevity. I I don't think, but I don't, you know, I don't know. What do you think, John? You're the, uh, you're the EE here. Uh, Not really. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. C-E-E-E-C, whatever. Right. Um, Based on all the things that I've read about batteries, Dave, the one thing about batteries, whether they be the battery in your iPhone or the battery in your car, is heat kills. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's true. The one, the battery in your car, for sure. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And I've had friends tell me this. So one would think that the thing that kills batteries, especially living in the Northeast, is the cold. And, you know, you get the amperage rating and stuff like that. But but pals of mine that live like in Arizona, they're like, no, 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 no. Heat is much worse than cold. Much worse. That is going to kill your battery. Yep. So I'm going to go with your speculation that the more heat that you generate, and, I, I, and I'm with you that the inductive nature of chi creates more heat than doing it through a lightning cable. The more heat, and, and also if you do a fast charge, that's probably going to generate more heat as well. So consider how you want to charge your device in order to prolong Yeah. The battery life. So I would say the more heat you generate, the quicker the battery is going to die. But I guess the question, because I would agree with that, you know, in theory, the question that we don't know the answer to is how much quicker. I mean, are we talking 1%, you know, quicker or 50%? Like, because there's a big delta there. If it's 1%, I'll take the convenience of Qi all the time, especially at night where I don't care how fast it charges. Just put it on the thing and let it go. You know, no problem. But if it's going to, you know, kill it 50 percent faster as opposed to one percent faster. Well, yeah, I might I might feel differently. So I mean, I, if know, anybody I knows, call... let us know. Feedback at Oh, no, 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 no. 
No, if you don't want your battery to die, you're going to send an email to feedback at MacGeekGab.com. No, 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 no. If you know whether our batteries are going to die faster and how much faster for Chi versus lightning, feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Yeah. Uh, now, the thing is, you could look here. So I'm just max uh, matching a website that I know exists and, uh, and okay. we might as well. Link to it as well, Dave, is that if you go to apple.com slash batteries slash maximizing dash performance, Apple has a little ditty, which has their advice on how to get the best out of your battery. And what do they say there? Oh, they, they say a lot of stuff. Temperature, they mention temperature. Okay. Uh, avoid extreme temperatures. Um, remove certain cases during charging. Store it half charged when you store it long term. And that a few more sense. things. Optimize your settings. And a little, uh, there's a lot of stuff here. So uh, and there's nothing on yeah. this page about Qi or wireless. Um, but yeah. So now you, you, you'd have to wonder if like the Qi consortium would have mm. you know some propaganda about this. <laughs> well, that's right. the thing is I'd rather hear not from the Qi consortium. Yeah, exactly. The, the, oh, our, our stuff's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't worry. Our stuff's great. Uh, you can also call us, me. you know, oh, at, right. uh, it, it, we told you how to email us, but 224-888-GEEK is the number that you can call us at, John. And John, geek uh, is? 4335. Three, three, now, Brett has a question about calling, because uh, Brett says, I get too many phone calls on my iPhone from local numbers that are robocalls. I was getting them on my home phone, but I have UMA. And I uploaded all my contacts to my UMA address book and set the preferences to call uh, that th any call from someone not in my address book goes to voicemail. He says it has made a huge difference. I'm trying to achieve something similar for the iPhone. He says I have I have posited a few options. Number one, set do not disturb to allow all contacts to ring my iPhone. I do this now because I don't use do, do not disturb for anything else. However, this lets calls through, but silences texts and notifications. So not optimal. Option two, set each contact to a ringtone instead of default, then set the default ringtone to silent. Okay. He says this will require me to go through every contact and set a ringtone and any new contacts would need to also set ringtones. Would be great if Apple provided an easy solution like default ringtones for contacts and separate settings for non-contacts. I'm willing to go through all my contacts to set a ringtone if I have to. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, Apple doesn't provide this, but your carrier might. Um, AT&T has an app that you can download called Call Protect, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes. It's available for free. That gets you auto blocking. And then uh, if you choose $2.99 a month, signs you up for Call Protect Plus that adds some customization features and reverse caller ID. I am an AT&T customer. I use the free version and it's it's like blissful. It's great. In fact, just earlier today while I was prepping this show, uh, I got a call and I look on my phone and it says telemarketer. And boom, that's it. It like just deals with it and off it goes. And it will block. Like there's calls that don't even make it to my phone because, uh, you know, they're on the list that AT&T has. But you've got to opt into this. So uh, that's AT&T's call protect. Verizon has an app called Caller Name ID, uh, also available to download for free. But there is no free use of it other than a 10 day trial. It costs two ninety nine a month for any of the features, but that two ninety nine a month does get you the reverse caller ID that you also get with AT and T if you pay them. But you can't do this for free. You can't get the call blocking for free if uh, if you're on Verizon, at least not from yeah. what I could tell. And I, then I tried it and I wasn't impressed. Really, I, I did the trial and it, was, it 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 didn't tell me anything beyond well, it's was it, it doing the blocking. Or you don't get enough of those calls to know. No. Okay. No, okay. I get. I mean, I get like many. I, I I get calls, and if it's not in my address book, then it shows maybe the locale that you know they they. Well, that's what I'm saying. They, if you have mm -hmm. like the AT and T Call Protect app has a a database of telemarketer numbers and and then other numbers too, and it will classify them right on my phone for me and 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 dispatch them. 
So I don't like I, I, I have it set to ring once for a telemarketer and I can look and be like, yep, nope. Okay, good. Cool. Awesome. Off you go. And then T-Mobile also offers a free solution, just like AT&T. T-Mobile's, there's no app required. You just log in on their website. It's a T-Mobile uh, resources call protection. I guess it's T-Mobile call protection. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that, uh, from what people say, works really well. Like AT&T, they offer an upcharge to add reverse caller ID. And theirs is actually a little more expensive. It's $4 a month, not th or not two ninety nine. dollars So uh, but we'll put links to those. So if you have AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, you can get rid of this. Uh, most likely uh, in a way that'll work for you. Uh, unfortunately, with Verizon, you got to pay. Um, there's also Nomo Robo, uh, which is, I think it's $1.99 a month after a free trial and that you can set up to use on your phone and also on your, um, uh, you can use it on your home phone too. It's not just for cell phones. So you've used no more robo, right, John? Um, I think I did the trial and also it did it. Um, my methodology, Dave, is that if it's a number and it's coming from a place, um, I mean, the, the, so I still get the things that have my first six digits of my phone number and it's coming from there. And the thing is, I know that's bogus because none of my friends have that, that extension it's to get you to think, Oh, well, you know, they have the same first six digits. So it must be somebody I know. Mm -hmm. And no. And then I get some, you know, Orlando or whatever. And the, you know, it's clearly forged. Then I just let my iPhone pick it up. It'll transcribe the voicemail if they decide to leave one. And it's usually one of either, Hooray, we're going to give you 0% on all your credit cards. Just give them, just give us the numbers or the IRS is going to come and bust me. And I forget the other one. But, uh, sure. Sure. That's, so you don't mind, you don't mind these calls getting through is, is, is essentially what you're saying. And if you're okay with that, I'll just say decline. I'll just, you know, if, if it, you know, right. Make my Mac. Yes. So, um, you're, you're okay. Self, self managing. Yeah. That is the low tech way that I manage it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. If I don't yeah. know who you are, I don't answer. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, I found because I'm some. I'm quite the opposite. If if my phone rings, I answer it. I I learned a long time ago that you know opportunity knocks, and if you pick up the phone, sometimes you're right there. Oh sure. Uh, but it is having my phone aware of a database of telemarketers and having it show me, Oh no, this is not just some random call from someone whose number you don't know, but might actually be somebody that you want to talk to as opposed to, Oh no, do you, if you don't want to take a survey, don't answer this call. Like, yeah, okay. That's, it's been super handy. So, mm -hmm. and especially for free with AT&T, it's easy. You know, that's a no brainer. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I do appreciate Brett's attempt to try to come up with a iOS based technological solution but i think all the things that you threw at him uh, one of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> hopefully yeah. one of them uh, yeah it's terrible I, I just wish they would have designed the system so that you, it wouldn't be so easy to spoof a phone number well that's you know you know what i'm that, saying but yeah but i mean that, that like that's how every system is right we would go back in time and and change the way SMTP worked if we thought about spam. And I mean, you know, it's just how it goes. Hey, you, um, you started playing around last week. You told us about your new thermostats that were coming. You were getting some smart thermostats that were not Wi-Fi thermostats, but they were Z-Wave thermostats. Did they, did those make it? Have you started playing with those yet? They made it. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it was a very, um, I'm up and running, man. So I really? got smart thermostats at a fraction of the price I would have to pay for a single nest. So yeah. So how many because, of these? How many of these things did you get, and what did you pay for them? So I have. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. So the thing is, I got three of them because I have three zones. Sure. In my uh, in my heating system, so I have baseboard. It's a it's a you know basically a gas furnace that heats water, and then it runs through the house and their fins and it radiates and, and okay so uh, you bought the three of these things how how much did you pay for each one you know that's the weird part is that the availability of these dave at least through amazon was very weird in that i paid three different prices from three different sources oh. 
Uh, I think the least expensive one was like forty bucks, and the most expensive one was like fifty bucks. Okay. So, so was, oh, uh, so uh, quite a bit less than a Wi-Fi thermostat. And and yours, correct. we talked about the C wire last time, and and you don't have the C wire in your in your wiring, which is the the wire that would provide power. You just have the red and white wires. Uh, and but th- these things, because they're low Bluetooth, low energy. They, no, they no, can no, run on Z-Wave. batteries. They're well, there's Z-Wave. Z-Wave. Sorry, that's not Bluetooth low energy. It's low energy. It's not Bluetooth. My, my apologies. Thank but you. But Z-Wave, so Z-Wave is both a uh, hardware standard for a radio and also, I think, a protocol for how to control things. Right, right. So um, so that's technology these use, and they, 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 they have four... Double A batteries, and they claim that the batteries will last two years. Uh, oh. My prior thermostats, which were programmable Honeywells, also had battery power because again, sure. I don't have that. Uh, yeah, that wire. Um, we'll see if they last that long. So but, I gotta um, get some of these things. This is a this sounds now okay. So tell me, you're able to like how do you can so here's so here's my environment. Them? Yeah. So the yeah. thing is, my environment. So there are a number of environments for smart home control. One of them, of course, is Apple's own HomeKit, which I have nothing that speaks it. And I'm not sad about that. I'm sad for Apple because I think they botched it, um, in my humble opinion. But the thing is, Z-Wave is a standard to talk to smart home devices. So you need a few pieces. Now, the thing is, the first piece that I got, Dave, actually, was when I bought one of these starter kits. And it had two GE light bulbs sure, uh, and a link, what they called a link hub which was only meant to talk to the uh, the light bulbs. I'm like, oh, well, that's a cool way to, for me to get into this. And, you know, it, it uh, integrated with the A word because they have a skill for that. Sure. And it was cool. I mean, you've been in my place. You, you could say lights on, lights no, it's, off. It's and, like the, the, the smart things hub or the wink hub or whatever, right? The uh, thing is, this hub was only meant to talk to light bulbs. And then one day it died. The, the light was flashing and it wouldn't control things. I'm like, okay. And so I looked on the market and now they make a... a big boy version of it called the the wink hub 2. Okay, so you got a wink hub that that is sort of universally speaks Z-Wave and it talks to your old bulbs and and now we'll talk to these new thermostats. So it speaks Z-Wave, it speaks Zigbee, it speaks right. what you mentioned which is Bluetooth LE and it speaks another Kitty I think. So, so it speaks like four protocols. So okay. this is for so most like of you if you want to of uh of of hubs. It's a smart home hub and it supports all the protocols and then you have an iOS app that you use to control it. Now you can do just that, but as I mentioned, you can also integrate it with um, an A word skill, and they they have a plugin, so so I can control it either through the app or through you know who. Yeah. Um, okay. So they, so the app is the app is an app that was built for your thermostats, or is it through the Wink app? It's the Wink app. Okay. So what you say is, okay. So you're like, okay, add a thermostat, and then they have a number of options. Some are explicit brand names, and then they're like, hey, okay. just add a generic Z-Wave thermostat. Okay. And so once developed, once you've got it added, how do you like what? What can you can obviously set the the temperature. I am assuming you can schedule things. Can you pull yes. it for data too? Exactly. Yes. So you can do all of those things. So oh. Z-Wave supports all that. So I can see the temperature at each of the thermostats. I can set the temperature or as, as you uh, assumed here, the Wink app lets you schedule events. Sure. So on its own, the only thing you can do with the thermostat, if you don't have Z-Wave or have it tied in, is you can just set the temperature up and down manually from the front panel. So it does, it's not a do. learning thermostat, right? Which is what like the, the Nest Correct. and the it's Ecobee a, will be if you want them to be. This is programmable just programmable through the Wink app. And Z-Wave is the protocol that they use to talk to them. And you could probably, if be, being that it's programmable through Wink, I'm guessing Wink links with both uh, Ift, right? And uh, why can't I think of the name of the other thing that I use to uh, stringify, right? So I don't I, know if it does, but the thing is it talks to... Uh, so the Wink app knows about my light bulbs and it knows about my thermostat. And it doesn't and it work with knows Ift? About I'm certain that the, it, it, it may. I, I okay. just haven't. Uh, uh, I, I just haven't looked into it. Yeah. OK. OK. I, I think so it right works now. With so it. right now, the Wink app is aware of my light bulbs, my thermostats, and also the two cameras, both the ring and the drop cam, which is now the Nest cam. Right. So 
So it's kind of, uh, so Wink is my, that's the world that I live in. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, yeah, but the cool, and it, what well, there is, um, Stringify does have a, a wink skill in it. So <clears throat> you can do all oh, of that. Okay. Yeah. Which is great. Right. Because now and I think you I could, have TTT may as well, but I, 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 just I would assume. Yeah. But what that means is you could have it notify you when the temperature gets too low. Right. You and know, it's built into the wink app. Actually, okay. one of the parts yeah. of, what I assume is a standard Z-Wave profile is that they have a thing saying, hey, would you like temperature alerts? And I think the default is like, if it gets above 80 or below 40, okay. we're going to give you a notification. Well, but you could, you could use bad. you could use IFT or Stringify to have it turn your lights on. And if you had colored lights, you could have it turn your lights red if there's a problem, right? So you don't have to have your phone right there. Like, you know, you've got a problem. Oh, sure. And, and another That's thing about the good. Wink app is that they have built into it and actually i should probably try it so i could either schedule my lights to kind of turn on and off to make it appear that the, or at yeah. least the four lights that i have hooked up to it but they also have a feature that kind of simulates that within the wink app i, I forget what it's called exactly you can say hey in, enable this feature that kind of randomly turns lights on and off so it looks like somebody's in the house. oh smart yeah 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 <laughs> cool that's great man that's a that so for people that you know, that know how to program their house for heat. This is a great little option. If you want to turn that, you know, from, from just being a, a programmable thermostat that's isolated, you could, you know, you can, like you said, you can create zones and stuff with them. So if your schedule says, uh, you know, turn the heat down at 8 a.m. when I leave for work, you know, turn it down to 60 and then at, at 5 p.m. when I'm going to be home, turn it back up to 66 or whatever. And you're not feeling well at work and you say, oh, I, you know, let's go home. I'm going to or I'm going to go home. You can, you know, trigger it with the app and say, hey, I'm heading home. Turn on the heat. And then way it's on when you get there. That's pretty good. I like pretty this. much. And, and e even the ones that I had before, which were just a basic Honeywell one that I, I would have four events. One would be. The okay, let's turn up the heat because it's it's time to wake up. Sure. Then let's turn off the heat because maybe you're going to go go out either you know to your nine to five or go out and do errands and stuff like that. And then another one, at least the way I have it set up, um, is oh okay, well you're home now uh, yeah. for the evening. Well, we're going to turn the heat back on, and then oh it's late at night. Well, we're going to turn the heat down again and right, right. manually either through voice control or through the you know the panel on the thermostat change that. So yeah. um. That's pretty good, so man. I'm hoping to save, uh, you know, it's not so much because as you know, I, I, I had a frozen pipe event and I'm not going to go into any more detail, but the thing is at that point in time, when I was traveling, I didn't have a way to see the temperature of things right. in my house. Right. Now I do. Yeah. I have three of them and set up to alert me if the, uh, so well, the, if you I, find, I say, if you find links for these things, cause right now you can't buy them. I have the link that you shared last week and this thing doesn't exist on Amazon anymore. Um, so what? really, I mean, it's there, there's, it's just, you can't buy it. Um, so yeah, yeah but the stock on it was very weird, but the thing is there are other, um, so yeah, if you find them, the put them in the, yeah, put them here in the show notes. That's great. Very cool. But there's man. a Z wave. I think there's a Z wave marketplace and, cool. and they, that's actually how I learned about this is that, you know, I follow them on Twitter and, and they were like, Hey, check, you know, check out our marketplace and see if there's something that. That's that great. Like. But yeah, the availability of it is kind of wacky, Dave. I mean, yeah. it's a company you never heard of, Go Control, I right. think, which is actually part of a larger company. And yeah, I, I had to buy it from three different places because the available. Well, if you folks, if so you folks weird. know of any uh, other Z-Wave thermostats that are in this similar range, you know that forty to sixty dollar price range, come and join us at uh, the Mac Geekab forums at MacGeekab dot com slash forums, and let us know. Like, you know, drop a drop a note in there. We'd love to. Love to hear about it. This is great. Very, very cool. And and also solves the problem for a lot of people that don't have C wires and can't use like an Ecobee or something. Uh, you know, you can you can do something like this because the power is much the power requirement is much less because the Z Wave uh bridge is doing its job. That's pretty good. You hey, know that weirds me out too. C wire is that it's 24 volts AC. Is that right? Uh I believe that's correct. Yeah, Why right. would you use it? I don't yeah. get it. That's right. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, another question from from Rod. I think it's the same Rod. In fact, he says, yes, um, "I have zero knowledge when it comes to SIM card technology." With that said, do you have any knowledge as to whether there's a difference between regular SIM and eSIM? Could there be a signal slash reception issue or performance functionality difference using one over the other? Assuming performance has nothing to do with the SIM technology, why even bother having physical SIM cards anymore? So a- as I understand it, and I've used eSIM with with the iPad, obviously, um, I don't yet have an iPhone, although I'll have a 10R this week that I'm going to check out. Uh, I've used it, you know, with the iPad and it uh, reception wise, it's it's no different. I mean, it's using the same antennas. It's you know, it's just how is it processing this connection to the you know, whatever well, the, carrier. The, the SIM is, if you will, your personality of your device. And, yeah. and with a physical one, you can pop it out and put it in another device and assume that it'll work in a similar fashion if it's not locked, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, and that, so that's the, that, that answers the second part of the question. And, and that's not necessarily, it's, there's pros and cons to this, right? Where if you have a SIM, you can just move it from device to device and things work fine. Again, as long as the devices are unlocked and able to use that SIM with an E and also it works with any carrier that can provide you a SIM with an E SIM. Two things are true. Number one, you can't move it from device to device. And number two, the E SIM is only supported by a limited number of carriers. Now, it might be supported by all the carriers that you care about, so it might not matter. But if you're in some country where they don't have an eSIM carrier like China and you just have to get a physical SIM. Well, that's what you have to get is that physical SIM and you put it in and you're, and you're good to go. Uh, But the eSIM is super handy. If you land in, you know, get off a plane in some country where, uh, where they do support the eSIM, you can sign up for a phone plan on your phone, right? You don't have to go and procure a SIM just to be able to, to do that. And, You know, when your plane lands at midnight, that can actually be a really handy thing. So that's the I think I think that in a nutshell, that hopefully answers the question. If anybody else has questions, you know, we already told you how to find us. So, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I think Verizon was doing kind of a hybrid version of this, because the thing is that one time when I upgraded my phone, I had to physically move the SIM from one to the other. Now, part of it could be because they're doing CDMA and all that stuff. But the last couple of times that I upgraded my phone, Dave, I didn't have to touch anything. And that it, it, I think what happened is it transferred the personality from the old SIM to the new SIM. So it was kind of a hybrid SIM. You see what I'm saying? And that I didn't have to move it. Well, that's because Verizon doesn't use a SIM, really. I mean, they have the fake SIM well, kind of thing, but CDMA oh, does I not use a SIM. My- uh, I don't know. I got a SIM. In my I, I, that's what I'm eight, saying. Dude. You have a SIM, but that SIM is not really for your your phone service. It's it's to get the phone happy to then connect to the CDMA <laughs> network. Yeah, I don't know about that. No, no, I do. Because if I like, take it and I put it on my iPad, I'll get I'll get data service. So it's it's, it's with Verizon. Yeah, really I'm telling you, man. Because for years, there were no SIMs for Verizon phones. Like when you got a Verizon iPhone, it was like there was no SIM tray. There was nothing. Yeah. No, I get it. No, now now they have it. And if I put in another device, it'll, you know. Really? Huh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Verizon is the, the, yeah, all all these CDMA guys. I think Sprint is another one. And who is a PCS and then a few others. But but CDMA slash GSM, because it, it does both. The phone is capable of doing both. Yes, that's right. Well, as far as I know, if I traveled in an area where there's only GSM, as far as I know, my phone would work. Like if I went to Europe and I, I, I think I'd have to throw some more money at Verizon to enable that. Right? Okay, so here's the deal. The mm-hmm. CDMA does not use SIM cards. The SIM cards okay. are there for Sprint and Verizon's LTE networks because the LTE standard uses SIM cards. Hmm. So there you go. There you go. That. So, yeah, that's 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 where that comes from. That's interesting. 
That's interesting. And Paul Franz in the chat room is saying, uh, he says, I thought that changed with LTE and that's exactly right. Yep. It's the nope. LTE right. requires SIM or LTE uses SIM. Uh, that's why we have those now. So there it's, and that's why you were able to get on, you weren't, you wouldn't have been able to get your iPad on a CDMA network that way, but you would have been able to get it on the LTE network that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, that explains it. Cool. Fun. I love this stuff. It's great. I want to thank all of our premium contributors for the last week here. Uh, as many of you know, you know, our show is supported in a variety of ways. We have our sponsors, of course. Uh, we have all of you listening, all of you contributing, asking questions, sharing tips, hugely valuable. Like it's, it, that's what, that's our content here, right? I mean, I know we funnel it together and we answer your questions when we can and all that stuff. But without you catalyzing all of that, this show is very, very different uh, and certainly doesn't exist in this way. So thank you. And then we have our premium program, which is was really created at your request. Uh, there were many of you that wanted to offer direct support to the show. And so that's that's what this is. So. Uh, if you visit MacGeekGab.com slash premium, you can see how it all works and uh, and get signed up if you care to, if you are able. But I do want to take a minute and thank all of our premium subscribers whose contributions came in this week on the biannual uh, $25 every six months plan. We have George C., Willie M., Gary B., Jed E., Scott S., Steve R., Laura S., Scott C., Andrew G, Deborah F, Lyndon N, all at 25. And then Ed I, Edward I, maybe Ed I, uh, at, uh, at $50 every six months. So thank you to all of you. And then on our monthly $10 plan in the last week, we had Michael P, Bob L, Jeff P, John V, John D, Kaz M, Ken L, Clive S, Dave G, Gary B, and Jeff F. So thanks to all of you. Really, um, I know we say it every time we do this, but it really does mean a lot. So very cool. You want to uh, you want to take us to Mark, John? I'm going to take us to Mark because Mark, you solved my problem, dude. Sweet. We love it when it works that way. <laughs> or at least his, my solving his problem solved my problem, Dave. So here's what Mark says. He says, hey, guys, after upgrading to 10.14 Mojave, I ended up with a folder called incompatible software that contains two files. I want to toss them, put them in the trash and try to empty, but get these notifications. Libgutenprint.2.0.3.dylib can't be modified or deleted because it's required by Mac OS. And... Now, uh, sneak peek here, I had the exact same problem with that exact same library predating this. Uh, but he also had another one, QMasterD, can't be modified or deleted because it's required by macOS. Now, first off, it's all lies, but uh, uh, let's continue. The operation can't be completed because the item incompatible software is in use. So, anyways, the story here is that he had files he couldn't delete. And the thing is, especially if you're an administrator on your machine, not being able to delete a file what? Come on. I'm running this operation. You're not going to allow me to delete that. You know what I'm saying? I do. And the thing is, Dave, I've had, uh, we discussed this in a pre-show chat at one point. So I've had this libgutenprint.2.0.3.dylib file living on my computer for years. Yeah. And I was never able to delete it because I did, uh, for the most part, this Mac Mini, I've done upgrade and not uh, uh, nuke and prave fresh right. installs sure and something just went horribly wrong because i tried everything dave i even went into so the thing is i, I would try with most somewhat technical users like those that are listening uh is maybe go into recovery and go to the terminal and try to delete it from there because the thing is when you're in recovery it's not in use by that mac os but it's in you're you're booting like a baby version of mac os when you're in recovery and the the mac os on your boot drive is a totally separate world right you're booting a separate version of mac os yeah that's right it's on the same drive but it's not the same mac os because then i can works. understand the concern with 
system files that are being in use, you don't want to delete them while you're using the computer because you're going to destroy everything. But I had the exact same problem, Dave. In that same folder, and uh, I was trying everything. The thing is, this time, Dave, when I tried it, and I'm suspecting it was a change, either APFS or Mojave, is that I did the same thing that I'm almost certain I tried in the past, is that I booted in a recovery, went to the terminal, navigated. Now, here's the thing. You may have to mount the drive in question, especially if it's a file vault thing. So that's another step, is that you got to mount the drive sure. through disk utility. Then, when you go in the terminal, you, you say cd slash volumes slash and start typing the name of your boot volume and hit tab, and that should complete it, and then go to wherever that stupid file lives. And this time, Dave, when I did it and I said RM space and, you know, the Guten print thing, yeah. it deleted it. Okay, it so you just complain. had to boot from a, you had to boot from a different drive is, is the net of all of that. The thing is, I'm almost certain, what I'm saying is I'm almost certain that I tried this in the past on a prior OS and it did not Hmm. work. What Hmm. I thought it should have is, it said, uh, I think when I tried to do an RM, which is remove in Unix space and the file, it said permission denied. I'm like, dude, what do you mean? I, I don't understand. So something subtle happened either because I migrated to APFS or I'm on Mojave, where finally I was able to get rid of this cursed file that i could never delete before yeah i've i've had that where i had to boot from something else to get a file to 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 go away because either because the the os had some permissions wrong or i i I seem to remember it being that it was a you know it would tag the file as in use or something it's like no it's not it's like if it if it is in use it shouldn't be uh, and so the only way to, to get it to do it was, yeah, rec- and recovery is great because it's a bootable partition right there, which is awesome. So we like that. That's good. So it worked. I mean, the thing is, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, it was a tiny little file, Dave. It was just. Uh, I'll control my language, but no, it was just bug. It's like, look, I'm running the operation here. You can't. Uh, I don't want this file here anymore. Let me delete it. Yeah. <laughs> and up until very recently, I couldn't get rid of it. So it was taking up a very infinitesimal amount of space, but it was just the fact that it wouldn't let me do what I wanted. That, yeah, you know, no, that's a thing, man, for sure. For sure. So I guess the, the, the overall tip here is that booting into recovery or another bootable drive to change things on a drive that's giving you permission and other, you know, permission denied things is a good strategy. So have Definitely. another bootable, yeah. either have recovery, which you should have if you're running a recent version of. Yeah, OS, right, right. Or have a bootable clone that, that you can use. Cool. Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's great, man. Yep. Or a <laughs> Linux boot drive. We've, I've got some stuff. We'll, we'll, oh, we'll, right, right, right. right. Although, although, as we said when we talked about that. If your drive is encrypted or running APFS, that starts to get a little more interesting trying to mount it with Linux. You're way better off with a recovery partition for that sort of thing. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. Let's, um, let's go. You know what? I have two questions that would be, uh, and, and actually will be answered most likely in two different podcasts that I do. Uh, we'll go to the first one, but, but they're very relevant for what we do here. Uh, they just happen to cross the streams, if you will. So we will go to Louis first and Louis, uh, Louis would also fit with my small business show that I do with Shannon Jean every week. He was the, uh, person while well, we did deals on the web together years ago. And then Shannon and I did, uh, um, uh, or Shannon alone did tech restore and, and Mac rescue and all that stuff. But, uh, but we do the small business show every week, which is a total blast. And if you're into that, you know, business show.co. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we will go to Louis's question, which is, I have a business related. Uh, I want to start selling pictures online. And I read that it would be more, it would be, It would appear more serious if I had my own domain name. My plan is as follows. I'll register a domain. I'll sign up on SmugMug and create my SmugMug website, which is a place to manage pictures. Great place to do that. Uh, 
And he says, then I'll re and I'll get, uh, you know, when you do that on smug mug and you set up a thing to sell your own pictures, you get essentially my domain dot smug mug dot com. And he says, then I would redirect all the traffic from www.mydomain.com to mydomain.smugmug.com. And I would set up e email using, you know, like user at mydomain.com. Great. Sounds like perfect. He says, my questions are, where do you suggest I register a domain? How should I settle for anything else than a .com domain? How easy is it to redirect? Uh, how do I set up email? And he says, I always, already use a free account with noip.com. Can I do this with their paid services or should I look elsewhere? So, um, you know, for domains, there are lots of places to register. Uh, I've been using GoDaddy for a long time. I know some people hate GoDaddy. That's fine. Uh, I don't hate them. So I continue to use them for a couple of reasons. But there are there like uh, Namecheap is another one that I've used. I have a separate business with some people and one of the guys hates GoDaddy. So we use Namecheap, which is fine. Um, the thing that I like about GoDaddy is that they make this redirecting from one domain to another very easy. Most of them do. They also usually include email forwarding with the domain. So you can forward up to 100 email addresses, which is super easy. But again, others will do that too. Um, is .com mandatory? You know, it depends on your audience, right? If I told all you people that uh, I have a new business and it's, you know, davesbusiness.co, right? Or davesbusiness.net or davesbusiness.tv. I don't think anybody listening to this show would have any trouble understanding that I did not say davesbusiness.com, right? Any of those things would be fine. You'd be okay with it. There are some people, though, that would listen to everything I said and say, oh, yeah, it's davesbusiness.com, right? Because it's just a thing. And the less technical, technically savvy someone is, the more they're going to think they heard .com because they think maybe that's the only thing that's out there. Uh, so depending on who you're marketing to, .com may or may not be important. That's sort of my, uh, you know, but, uh, but you have any thoughts on that, John? I don't know how much flexibility. I mean, you know, there's dot org, there's dot info. I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. You're like our our local transportation is MTA dot info. Why right. info? I don't know. Right. I guess I that's mean, true. Selling stuff. It's yeah. a commercial entity. I mean, you can buy stuff on the site, but it's dot info instead of dot com. Well, you can so, sell things on any. I mean, the, the type of domain it is doesn't matter. It's just what are people going to remember? I mean, to me, as long as you get a registrar that, that, that you know. Uh, maintains the record properly. I, I don't know if it, and, and I know they've expanded. I haven't really looked into this, but I, I don't know if you can choose anything as the last three or four characters of your well, domain all, name, but there, there's all these top I mean, level you domains. Do, yeah. There's I mean, a bunch of new ones. Dot photo. I don't know. I don't know if there's a dot photo domain. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to sell photos, I would think, Hey, maybe that, that, that's a good thing to consider. I, I don't know if they had, Yep. Uh, name that. name cheap has dot photo domains. So there you go. Squarespace right. has well, them. Name cheap. I'm assuming GoDaddy does, you know. Yep. There you go. Sure. Nice. <laughs> That's Good work. So great, if if yeah. you're if if your only intent is to sell photos, then dude, I, I get a dot photo domain. <laughs> that is a fantastic idea. Yeah. I like it. Very good, man. <laughs> That's perfect. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. 25 bucks a year. So, or 2588 wow. or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Really? That's it? That's huh. it. Yeah. That's pretty good, man. Good thinking. Yeah. So there you go, Louis. Hopefully that helps. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it helps. Pretty good. Uh, I mean, the uh, other, oh, it, you know, the, it, I was just thinking in my head here. So, so we, ha uh, I know a few folks and actually uh, there's a, a thing called Photo Plus Expo happening on the East Coast here um, mm -hmm. this week. I'm going to be going to it at least one day. I got my, you know, good. uh, uh, confirmation that they they still recognize me as a tech journalist i think sure. so um but um this is a, a show on the east coast and they have in other places for uh, photographers but um i know a few professional photographers and and my maybe there's something you could talk about on your show dave maybe we should get a one of my friends uh, involved here is making money selling photo photos is tough <laughs> Look, making money doing anything is tough. 
I, really, right, but, but like it takes the hard. Eh, I don't, you know, I I'm not convinced that there's any business that's just in you know intrinsically difficult. I I I really think as long as you understand your market and you're willing to put in the work and you're willing to deliver a product that people want to buy, then you know. It's, I mean, it's business, right? Nope. I don't, I don't know that any business the, is easy. The thing is there, there are so many people out there, especially with the iPhone and uh, there are so many people that can take photographs Yeah, and kind of like in um, Ratatouille where the, the chef said, everybody is a chef. The thing is, everybody is a photographer. The thing is not everybody is necessarily a good photographer. Well, so you've got a really crowded space and the thing is, how do you get exposure in order to make money by taking pictures? Well, I'm saying so yeah I, I do but but I also I mean then th- th- this is th- you're right this would be a great topic for the small business show I'll I'll briefly say maybe if you're going to be in the business of selling photos general consumers are not your best customers right maybe you're better off targeting corporations targeting people that actually see the value in you know automatically see the value in what it is you're selling maybe you sell through someone like Shutterstock or, you know, any one of those aggregator sites. Right. To me, that's kind of the thread here is that. Uh, all right. So so paying for a domain name, that's that's easy. Mm-hmm. But finding a service. So Smugbug and actually I have friends that have used Smugbug. Um, OK, the thing is, they get a cut. You get a cut. The thing yeah. is, the, the, there are a lot of services that some would feel, especially photographers, that kind of exploit the photographers and that they take too much. So do you go on your own? Yeah, you go on your own. Yeah, start marketing to direct to companies. I mean, it like it's like any business. If you want a middleman to do the job for you, then you're going to pay what that what the market says that's worth, right? Or you're not, or you choose not to. It's it, it again. It's how much work do you want? To do. Anyway, uh, if you want more of that stuff, small business show at businessshow.co. Now. Uh, moving on to Marcus, staying in the Mac Geek Gab realm. Although I will say, as I said before, this one sort of hits a, uh, it hits two things. It hits what we talk about here, but also what we talk about on my Gig Gab podcast for working musicians. And Marcus asks, I'll find it. Oh, it was right there. Uh, he says, I'm asking for a recommendation for a good app to slow down music on iOS. My seven-year-old daughter is learning cello, and I'm looking for a good slow downer app to export pieces that she needs to learn. Something that can handle Apple Music or Spotify would be good. Also, pay once option would be good so that uh, she can use it on all the family devices through family sharing. Her teacher uses the amazing slow downer app. Uh, I have used any tune free and the tempo slow mo app. They're all about the same price for pro versions. I'm wondering which is best for the cost. I know Dave has mentioned Capo, but that is subscription based. And uh, I, I stick with Capo. It's freaking amazing. Capo Touch uh, is it, by far my favorite for this. Not only can it slow things down, but it shows you the chords. It finds the time signatures. It, I mean, it like I used it on on something the other day. It was, we were talking actually on Gig Gab about songs that start like not on in an obvious place in the beat or whatever. And, uh, and Capo still figured it out. Like the Beatles drive my car, right? You know, that, that whole, that, that whole, that intro, right? Right. That thing starts on an upbeat. It totally figured it out. And, uh, and then you can slow things down and go through and, and see where the beats are and everything. Capo is, is by far, the one that uh, that I would recommend for this, I've I've used them all, and for someone trying to learn an instrument, Capo makes it really easy to uh, to do it. It's it's it, they've got uh, guitar fingerings, they've got piano chord like fingerings where they'll show you where to put your hands on the piano. It's really cool. So anyway, that that Capo's it. I I can't imagine using anything else for that. So. Or Capo Touch, I guess, is is the one for the uh, for the iPhone. So we'll put a link in the show notes to that. But yeah, I don't have anything other than that. That's that's my thing. I I'm I I don't mean to assume anything, John, but I will offer an assumption that you've never tested any of these types of things. Is that right? Um. Yeah, I shouldn't. 
I don't think psychoactive substances should probably no discussion. Right? No, 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 no. <laughs> that could be one way to make things speed up or slow down, right? Uh, it might change your perception of <laughs> of time, um, and we could get into a whole discussion about the fact that time is is not nearly as constant as as our feeble human brains might what? might want it to th- to think it is. Physics geek gap here. Well, no. you know, there you go. You brought so you it up. Time is relative. Definitely. There Definitely. Kind of talked about that. What was his name? I forget. Yeah. 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 Like that. yeah. So. Yeah. No. Time is. I, I, we just our feeble human brains. We need to perceive it as this linear construct. It's fine, but it's not actually how it is. I don't think. But I, I can't I can't tell you what it is because I have I, I suffer from the same feeble human brain limitations that the rest of us do. So there you go. Hey, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about chapters and also that we may do away with the AAC version of this show. And we got a note from actually we got notes, I should say, from a few of you. Andrews sort of summed it up where he says you briefly mentioned that you were thinking of getting rid of. Of the enhanced AAC chapters, please keep them. There are many podcast players out there that still support AAC. I've been using Downcast for many years, and it works great with your AAC chapters. I can easily go to certain points in the show, listen to a particular topic. Uh, he says, it's one of the reasons I love your show. Downcast would also show the different photos you used to add per chapter. Uh, and Downcast even lets me use the chapter function on my Apple Watch. Okay, so... I told, I'm totally with you. I'm totally with all of you. And we would never get rid of the chapters. Here's the thing. Getting rid of the AAC does not mean getting rid of chapters. It used to like a hundred years ago, but right now we publish both AAC and MP3 feeds and both. Yes, both have chapters in them. And every podcatcher, podcast listener software out there supports chapters in both the AA3 and MP3, including Downcast, including Apple's podcast app on the iPhone. All of them do. Overcast, you name it, chapters are supported, except one, and that is (laughs) iTunes on the Mac. So when I say that we're going to get rid of the AA, potentially, and I think we will, but we haven't really made the decision yet. Uh, when we, it, if and when we get rid of the AAC feed, we would have one feed, which is sort of the goal. It would be MP3 only. It would have chapters in it, and it would work with everything. Except you would no longer see our chapters in iTunes on the Mac. So that is um, the that's the one place where you would miss it out. But otherwise, you could run Downcast on the Mac, no problem, right? No problem. It's just iTunes. Why Apple? Like their libraries support it. They're obviously doing it on the phone. Why in the world they haven't put it into iTunes? I don't know, but that's that. Yes, John. You would think that iTunes being the kitchen sink of Mac software would support this one little. Yeah, no. Facet of. No. Podcast or, or audiophile chaptering, but. They don't. I, I'm, I'm just baffled. I, uh, yes, I same. Kinda... Yeah, that's good. All right. We have time for one more. And so I will leave the we have a couple about photos that we will come back to next week. I promise. JP has a question, though, and I think we might have an answer for him. JP says, fellers, is there a way to only sync my desktop items and not my documents with iCloud? And so here's the thing, not technically, no, JP, you cannot. And that's only because the way, uh, you know, when you go into system preferences and you go to iCloud and you go to iCloud drive and you go to options, you, one of the options that you have there is to sync the desktop and document folders. There's no way to dig deeper than that. So the answer is no, it's all well, both or nothing, but If you store your documents in a different folder, then you'll still sync the desktop folder and the documents folder. But if the documents folder is empty, well, then it won't be syncing anything because there's nothing to sync. 
you can create another folder that contains your actual documents. It's no problem. I've actually done this for years. I created a separate folder years ago when I started testing different things like Resilio Sync, which was BitTorrent Sync, and then Synology's Cloud Station and Synology's Drive. So my documents actually don't live in my documents folder, but they are synced amongst all of my Macs because I use a different syncing engine. But if you want to use iCloud and you don't want to have your documents synced, well, just don't store them in the documents folder. That's the... To me, that's the easy answer. Any other thoughts on that, John? Ah, we lost John. So John is coming back here. I think we'll have him in a minute here. You know, there's something about John's connection, folks, that uh, it's just not quite right. But I think he's about to be back. So welcome back, my mm -hmm. friend. So I think you heard you heard enough of that. Sync the documents folder, sync the sync the turn on documents and desktop syncing, but empty your documents folder, store your documents somewhere else. That would let you sync the desktop with iCloud without having to sync your documents. Uh, thoughts on on that before we uh before we bid our friends farewell for the day? Um yeah, I was scratching my head over that. How to decouple those, but uh personally what I do is it yeah. So the one thing that if you do enable the iCloud syncing there it does move your documents folder to a mysterious new location which right the way i deal with that is i put it in my sidebar um and the other thing you mentioned here is actually i've had this happen so things on my desktop when i delete them i get this you know uh, notification saying hey you're deleting this from my cloud dude are, are you sure about that it's mildly annoying but sure sure so i can deal with the current state yeah, I think he just things, doesn't want to use but, uh, his storage for that. So no, no, I, I no, yeah. I get it. Yeah. But yeah, makes sense. Yeah, perfect. All right, folks. Well, that does bring us to the end, doesn't it? Fun stuff, though, and that's why we do this. I learned something. Did you learn something, John? Did you learn your <sighs> five things? I, I couldn't believe how much I learned. Well, it's you're not going to believe what happens my, my, next. My brain, hurt. my brain hurts. That's right. You know what happens next? What? Mac Geek Up 733. That's next week. That's what you're not going to believe it, but that's what happens next. I believe I, it. I, yeah, I promise you. Uh, as I said, visit us, macgeekup.com slash forums. Really great stuff happening. Thank you for all of you that have uh, come and joined and participating. It's a great community and really growing fast. So good stuff. Huge, huge thanks to Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com, providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. And of course, all of our sponsors in the podcast marketplace. That includes, uh, of course, iMazing, as you heard about at the beginning of the show and in the middle of the show. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. Ring at ring.com slash MGG. LinkedIn Jobs at linkedin.com slash MGG. So many more coming. It's good stuff. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for all your questions. Thanks for all your answers. Thanks to everyone in the chat room. Thanks to you, John. Always fun to get to chat with you every week, my friend. And uh, one little piece of advice, though. One? Well, it's one piece in, in, in three words, but it's, it's one thing. And that is, uh, you know, while you're out and about this week, while you're doing whatever you're doing, using your computer, not using your computer, driving walking, flying, whatever it is, make sure that you don't get caught. Made up.